So uh, I'm uh, happy that you consider me your friend now, <laughs> given that uh, we are here together. Um, I will have a uh, maximum of 15 minutes because we are late in, in the program. So uh, we will end on time, that's important. Uh, and I uh, will start uh, without further ado by saying just a few words about myself. Uh, I'm Christian, pleasure meeting you all. I'm a PhD candidate uh, generally at the Technical University in Sofia, but on an exchange in Brno University of Technology. Uh, so I'm uh, your uh, guest at the, the university as an institution and I will be um, speaking about the application of the open source beyond IT. Is it possible? I think it is based on an example that I will provide from the world of education. But uh, keep in mind you are at the right section, right? It's open science. So at the end we will discuss more why the topic is here is in open science and, and not in open education, for example. Uh, but let's keep uh, this for the end. Starting with uh, uh, where we are currently, um, maybe this is the most important thing to do. We are at uh, the edge of the so-called fourth industrial revolution which uh, many people also do tend to call that is the second uh, information technology revolution uh, the first starting from, from the 50s and uh, the second starting around uh, the uh, end uh, of the, um, the financial crisis which uh, of course uh, due to a lot of economists caused a big exponential development in uh, new technologies because every such uh, uh, curve uh, in the economic cycle uh, is um, suggested, su suggested to, to, cause, uh, to cause such disruptive uh, technological revolutions. So uh, the fourth industrial revolution associated with the so-called cyber physical systems, what it means uh, to us, it means that we are bridging more and more uh, the information technology systems and, and uh, the physical systems. So we are bridging more and more society with machines and we are creating hybrid systems. And my assumption uh, when I started to work on my research was that uh, this convergent, convergence of uh, systems, uh, te technology and society will create the need for a more of a open cooperation even more than we see it now because obviously we, we, we're moving data closer together therefore we need to move teams that analyze this data and work with this data closer together so inevitably we will have an urge to push in the, um, the direction of openness and, and uh, last year uh, in December I published an article called 2017 will be the year of the Internet of People, which means that in, in the previous uh, iteration of, of the technology revolution, we were speaking about Internet of Things, right? We are connecting our machines, we are connecting our uh, fridge and the milk, and they're exchanging information so we know where, when the milk is getting bad. You know, but uh, this technology uh, inevitably will, will bring to, to will bring us uh, to to the uh, the point in time where we'll start using leveraging these uh, IoT devices and IoT uh, technological advancement to bridge uh, ourselves together, like like people, uh, peer to peer networks, distributed computing, uh, Bitcoin as an exchange of, uh, you know, the, the form of previous banking in which you have an entity between the parties and this entity is used to, you know, uh, be uh, in the middle. While I, I believe that the Internet of, of people is just getting peer-to-peer -peer and connecting without this middleman in between. And uh, the boom of the so-called initial coin offerings this year uh, actually proved me right because more than three billion uh, dollars were, were raised for such projects for the so-called Internet of People projects uh, through, through the blockchain uh, and uh, yeah uh, keep, that, keep that in mind that this is something that um, will be uh, unfolding in the years to come uh, and uh, but I'm a researcher more or less so I, I'm not uh, looking at the commercial uh, implementation of, of this technological advancement uh, that much as, as uh, much as I'm looking uh, from purely scientific perspective. So, uh, from scientific perspective, to try to capture the developments, you need to see what has been working, what has been there, 
to analyze why it was successful and then try to, you know, um, uh, extrapolate on this success. So we have open source success since the 60s, right? These successful projects, I think we need to analyze what are the key success factors behind their development throughout the years so that uh, using the knowledge that we have gained from, from all these examples, great examples that we have, we can extrapolate and we can see can we have open source beyond hardware, can we have open source beyond software and if we can have, how it should be organized as a project how these new systems, new type of open source systems should basically work uh, based on, on the best practices that we see back, back si since the, 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 the 1960s. Um, I came to the conclusion that uh, based on, on previous research, they, there are two key pillars for an, a successful open source project. So we have uh, the pillar which is related to decentralized development, like basically development, software development, and uh, also the open cooperation part. So you cannot have a successful open source project which uh, sucks in terms of, uh, you know, uh, quality uh, of the, the outputs uh, of, of the, the system as such, but you also cannot have a successful system if you don't have a successful community. So what I did is I tried to, to differentiate the success factors in two categories, and on the next slide what I'm doing is I'm showing what are the success factors that I was able to capture uh, and of course to aggregate at a big level of aggregation, meaning that, uh, for example, uh, contextual awareness does not speak that much because contextual, contextual awareness, I came to the conclusion, is a factor, factor for success, but actually is, uh, you know, uh, at a higher level of accumulation of aggregation of uh, factors of a lower level of uh, information. Therefore, you know, I will not be stopping here, but my point is that I, I came to the conclusion that those are more or less the, the main factors for success when we speak of the open cooperation part. Remember, we separated cooperation from development. And what I found to, and was really interesting is that when uh, we do research and we ask uh, stakeholders that are participating not in open source projects, not in software development, but are, are participating in um, uh, social innovation projects, they, they tend to say, yes, those are the same critical success factors that uh, work for us, that work for social innovation projects. So. The, the, the main outcome of this finding for me personally was the, the fact that uh, whether we are speaking about the classical open source projects like Linux, like uh, uh, all kind of, uh, you know, uh, applied or, or uh, operational software, or we are speaking of social innovation where uh, collaborators are uh, cooperating in a dispersed, distributed manner, we are speaking about the same factors for success. Uh, therefore, this allowed me to further extrapolate what I initially intended to do and try to find how we can build uh, the, the so-called open source university as a pilot uh, implementation of my concept in the field of academia. Why uh, I, I believe we need the so-called open source university as a system uh, that bring, bring brings together the two worlds, the open source world and the social innovation uh, world. Because according to Ernst and Young, we have the so-called information coordination relationships as a key issue which stops the economy and the, the learning and development world into uh, having the right match of skills to jobs for, for young people uh, in general, but also for lifelong learners. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the main problem according to Ernst and Young, uh, based on their research, is that the poor quality of this information coordination relationships uh, brought us to where we are, uh, brought us to, uh, you know, um, just an economy that is not fit for its purpose in the 21st century. And surprisingly, the open source approach is the best to address the information coordination relationship deficits because the data is there, the collaborators are uh, giving their inputs and they are benefiting from the outputs of, of this aggregated uh, knowledge from an open source system. Therefore, an open source university might address uh, perfectly this problem with the information coordination relationships. 
I would skip this slide in a few more, uh, given the short uh, time span. But uh, what I'm trying to show on this and a few other slides which will be available in the presentation is that we're not speaking of some, uh, you know, uh, innovation that's unseen and unheard. We are, we are iterating on previous findings, we are iterating on the so-called share, sharing economy 1.0, now moving to the sharing economy 2.0. And uh, here is uh, where we are. Imagine if this is the... Um, imagine if this is the, the, the world of uh, learning and education these days. Uh, all of these uh, offices that are shining in the dark are actually different institutions uh, generating knowledge, generating uh, information. Some of them are universities, some of them are corporations, the new players like uh, the non-formal education providers, the online learning providers. They are generating and generating, generating knowledge and content, but still we have the issues with this information coordination relationships because simply the knowledge is too dispersed to be uh, available for uh, for proper comprehension from the different parties so that they can benefit from the best insights, uh, create the best programs and basically uh, guide the economy in the right direction. So what we, uh, me and my team started to think about was a concept that we are not trying to centralize these processes of knowledge uh, generation and aggregation, but more or less we are trying to create a distributed network uh, in which uh, actually which allows uh, these uh, insights, this generation of, of uh, knowledge uh, and value to be organized but in a decentralized, in a distributed manner and uh, instead of having a man in the middle, which remember I mentioned was a problem, to have a system that allows this collaboration to happen in a distributed manner. So this is what we, we are calling the, the, the open source university and that's why we decided to go with the blockchain as an underlying technology because it actually allows this kind of uh, cooperation to happen. I would again be skipping some of the insights on blockchain 101 because currently in another lec lecture they are discussing cryptocurrencies so we are not the right audience for this purpose. But you may have heard about it and, and you may be passionate or you may have heard about it and you may be sick about it because you know there is a lot of hype and people are saying that this will be the next big thing in every industry but uh, from time to time uh, from time to time this is speculation i believe this is the right technology for the so-called open source university concept because it allows us two main things decentralization and autonomous verification which we need to have if we want to organize the the, the diploma of the future uh, like a decentralized thing, not like a siloed uh, paper from a single source. So you need, you know, you need the decentralization, but you also need the autonomous uh, validation and verification of the learning achievements. What we are doing with, with the team that I'm representing, like a research and development team, is uh, building a, a, a platform, the Open Source University platform, which is um, basically running on smart contracts built on the Ethereum network. If some of this does not, you know, uh, ring a bell to, to, to some of you, we will have another opportunities to speak. I will be happy to, to get in touch with you. But basically what those smart contracts are allowing is to have the centralized connection between academia, meaning different universities and learners, so that learners are not dependent of a single institution as a provider of their learning, but they can basically crowdsource it from different universities. Uh, also, we have a smart contract to enable the interaction between businesses and learners, which means that when you basically crowdsource your education, you will be able to, to get found from uh, businesses based on big data analytics. And uh, these businesses will be able to either hire you if you are a graduate or uh, basically uh, provide you a learning pathway for um, corporate uh, learning and development uh, like a lifelong learner uh, throughout your career. And we have another smart contract that, that uh, on the blockchain will allow businesses to get in touch with academia. So using these insights, businesses would be able to basically guide the academia on which are the best programs to be organized. And if you do not have the capacity to create, let's say, in the Bern University of Technology master program in blockchain development, 
maybe you have one good course, but you will be able through the blockchain to connect with other universities who have other good courses and create a so-called distributed learning pathway to then deliver and provide the value to the business and to the learner. Basically, these are, are the kind of open collaboration opportunities that the distributed database, which the blockchain uh, basically is, would allow us to have in the future of, of learning and in the future of education. This is a project I'm, I'm telling you about that started in 2015 uh, and uh, further develops as of this day. This is um, the team behind this project. Uh, we have a former Minister of Education of Bulgaria, Professor Sergei Gnatov, on the board. We have heads of universities, we have professors, we have startup and blockchain enthusiasts. But most of all, I would like to have uh, people like you, like a distributed team throughout the world to, to work on this project. So you're all invited to, to find us, uh, speak with me and, and join us because it's an open source project. And I'm ending this uh, presentation with a short, exactly five minute video, which would allow us to end on time, which video will show you what I'm speaking of in a quite uh, more organized manner. But the greatest thing, because I don't want to continue after the video, the greatest thing about this video is that this video is basically explaining our project, but in the same time is ha having, it does not have to do anything with our project. So this is an initiative run in parallel to ours from the US. They gathered 2,000 uh, learning and development enthusiasts and innovators and they came to a solution to the problem and they came to conclusions similar to ours. So it's great because, as I say on the last slide, which you will see after the video, uh, we have um, a future that is happening now, but it's not commonly distributed. So, you know, you, you can be working on the same thing in the same time, but not knowing about it. And actually the blockchain as a technology uh, um, allows us not to uh, get uh, stuck to, to this problem because uh, through the blockchain, you can distribute the, the future, you can distribute the insights, you can distribute the knowledge more commonly, more uh, fairer, if you like. Uh, something that we did not have and something which uh, stopped me from working with these guys in the US for the past two years on basically the same thing. So check them out. Your lecture count tracks everything you've ever learned in units called edge blocks. Each edge block represents one hour of learning in a particular subject. Anyone can grant edge blocks to anyone else. You can earn edge blocks from a formal institution like a school or your workplace. But you can also earn them from individuals or informal groups like a community center or an app. The ledger makes it possible for you to get credit for learning that happens anywhere, even when you're just doing the things you love. Your profile displays all the edge blocks you've earned. Employers can use this information to offer you a job or a gig that matches your skills. We'll keep track of all the income your skills generate and use that data to provide feedback on your courses. When choosing a subject to study in the future, you may wish to choose the subject whose students are earning the most income. You can also use the ledger to find investors in your education. Since the ledger is already tracking income earned from each edge block, you can offer investors a percentage of your future income in exchange for free learning hours. Our smart contracts make these agreements easy to manage and administer. The ledger is built on blockchain, the same technology that powers Bitcoin and other digital currencies. That means every edge block that has ever been earned is a permanent part of the growing public record of our collective learning and working. Always learning, always earning. That's my motto. I try to learn something new every month, but it ain't easy. <coughs> I'm a freelance delivery driver, so my schedule isn't steady. One thing that helps, I love to read. So I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I'm driving. Memoirs, history, philosophy. Oh, and I got that app that gives you blocks whenever you finish your book. I started teaching last summer right after the federal government announced the Pay It Forward program. You know about that, right? If you have federal student loans from college, you can pay them down.
down by teaching someone else what you learned. Whatever blocks you earned in school, you can teach them to others. The University of Texas, that's where I did my degree, they report all my college credits directly into the ledger, so I'm pre-approved to teach any subject I passed. Like virtual reality programming. If I can teach someone that course, I get $2,500 off my debt. I use the same textbook that I used in college, and I Skype with them three times a week to answer questions and help them with their coding assignments. Yes, I won. This is Texas Hold'em. It's one of those protein folding simulators where you learn how proteins work inside the human body. And you can help solve puzzles for science. Every time you solve a puzzle, you win this biochemistry energy block. And the better you get at it, the harder the puzzles get. Well, I guess I got pretty good at protein folding. Because one day, this trophy showed up. And they started doing super hard puzzles, working on these mind-blowing structures that even the real scientists haven't figured out yet. But wait a minute. I'm one of the real scientists now, actually, because I'm not just earning edgy blocks now. They're also paying me for every puzzle I solve. This game is sort of like my first class in biochemistry, and it's also my first job. We used to have this concept of entry-level jobs. You would start with a company, and then you could move your way up. That's how I started here. We hardly have any full-time jobs here. We mostly hire on a project basis. We check their ledgers, and if their credentials match our needs, then we'll put them in the hiring pool. Of course, relationships are still important, and we still help people grow. They're earning edge blocks with every hour of work they put in. Every project we hire for, we don't just list the monetary compensation. We also list exactly how many edge blocks in which skill areas will rent you. That way, your work here counts as learning for your next gig. It's all connected. Why do you have so many generic tests where you can actually evaluate your work in a real world context? When you log into a verification site, it gives you a task, an opportunity to do some real work for a real client. You can write some text, you can translate, you can design a logo, create an essay, print some data, that kind of thing. You even pay for your time. You're not the going rate, you're more like minimum wage. When did anyone ever get paid for taking a final exam? This can do this, what you can do with the ledger system. There are teachers everywhere that are waiting to share what they know. You can really, truly pursue any dream or passion you have. Well, of course, it's overwhelming. You can get lost in the options. I've always been lost. Later, most people find themselves at a point in their learning where they need to make a decision. Do you go for the traditional college degree or build your own higher education? That's the kind of tough choice that a lot of young people are facing right now. When it's my turn to teach, I take it really seriously. Because for me, learning has always been the one thing that... So, yeah, I'm stopping it uh, just to mention that you have additional information and that I will remain a bit remain available for uh, further cooperation on this uh, vision because the, the funny thing is that the video you show was just a vision of a futurist institute called institute for the future so it's not a real project and what we are doing is actually the real project to create the first iteration of this vision if it's interesting to, to you then this is open science you know to be able to work together and cooperate through the blockchain together wherever you are and for whatever institution we work. Thank you for your attention.